All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. It is Wednesday, and you know what that means. Time to continue our series and our research in Hermetics and the Corpus Hermeticum Divine Pymander original manuscript, Hermes Trismegistus, 3rd century AD. Now, this is a new edition, 2015, so not that new, edited by Taro Warwick. But, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a fantastic series, and as you can see, we are almost to the end. And so thank you for joining me today. Thank you for being here. Love and appreciate each and every one of you. Hope you are comfortable because this is about to get deep like it always is, ladies and gentlemen. Asking the deepest questions of reality. Talking about such things. Well, I'll just read what it says here. Credited to Hermes Trismegistus, the divine Pymander, sometimes spelled Poemander, touches upon astronomy, science, nature, and a great deal of theological material as well as all of the other greatest questions of reality. What is the nature of reality? What is the nature of God? What is the nature of our spiritual existence? And so on and so forth. Now, we are on chapter 14, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, of Operation and Sense. And we began this last Wednesday, and I think we made it about a page and a half in, because it was so deep, but this time we'll restart and we'll try to get our way all the way through it, at least see how far we can make it. There's 67 lines. So with that being said, of Operation and Sense, chapter 14 of the Corpus Hermeticum or book 14. And I'll give you a quick recap of the books we've been through. Hermes Trismegistus' first book, number two was Poe Mander. Number three was The Holy Sermon. Number five was The Key. Sorry, number four. Number five was that God is not manifest, yet is most manifest, which is very interesting, talking about the nature of God and how it is physical and yet non-physical. Very, very good. Six, that in God alone is good. His secret sermon in the Mount of Regeneration. Seven, eight was his greatest evil and man is not knowing good. Nine, the universal sermon to Asclepius. 10 was the mind to Hermes, 11 of the common mind to Tut, 12 his crater or Monas, 13 of sense and understanding, and now 14 of operation and sense. Let us begin, ladies and gentlemen. It begins by saying, Tut said, you have well explained these things, O Father. Teach me furthermore these things. For you said that science and art were the operations of the rational, but now you say that beasts are unreasonable and for want of reason, are called brutes, so that by this reason it must needs follow the unreasonable creatures partake not of science or art because they come short of reason. Two, it must needs be so, O son. He continued, why then, O father, do we see some unreasonable living creatures use both science and art? as the ants hoard up for themselves food against water, or food against winter, sorry, and fowls of the air likewise make them nests, and creeping things beasts know their own dens. So he's asking, if only humanity has this sense, or this rational nature, and therefore can use science and art, and beasts are unreasonable, or unrational, and cannot use science and art, how then, is he asking, do they do these things, such as hoarding up food against winter and building nests and knowing their own dens and these things? He answers, number four, these things they do, O son, not by science or art, but by nature. For science and art are things that are taught, but none of these brute beasts are taught any of these things. It comes of their own nature, I'll add. But these things, being natural unto them, are wrought by nature, whereas art and science do not happen unto all, but unto some. As men are musicians, but not all, neither are all archers or huntsmen or the rest, but some of them have learned something by the working of science or art. Seven. After the same manner also, if some ants did so and some not, you would thus well say 
they gather their food according to science and art. But being that they are all led by nature to do the same thing, not to do the same thing, it says to the same thing. So they are led by nature to the same thing. Even against their wills, if it is manifest, they do not do it by science or art. Nine, for operations, O taught, being intangible, are in bodies and work by bodies. Wherefore, O taught, inasmuch as they are intangible, we must say they are immortal. But inasmuch they cannot act without bodies, I say they are always in a body. For those things that are to anything, or for the cause of anything made subject to providence or necessity, cannot possibly remain idle of their own proper operation. Now this was where we did a lot of rambling last week and tangented about necessity, providence, operation, and these very important words in this hermetic philosophy that seem to mean so much beyond just a single word. Ah. 13. For that which is shall ever be, for both the body and the life of it is the same. So that's ex describing our immortal spiritual nature. Remember, in this philosophy, we have a dual nature. We are both mortal and immortal at the same time, physical and spiritual. And so, for that which is shall ever be, for both the body and the life of it is the same. And by this reason it follows that the bodies are also, bodies also are always, because I affirm that this corporeal nature is always by the act and operation or for them. For although earthly bodies be subject to dissolution, Yet these bodies must be the places and the organs and the instruments of action. But actions are immortal. And that which is immortal is always in act, and therefore also death, if it be permanent. 17, see that one was really deep. But acts are immortal, but actions are immortal, and that which is immortal is always in act and therefore also death if it be permanent. I'd love to know what you think, so leave me your thoughts in the comments, ladies and gentlemen. It's always good to get your opinion and your take on this. I'm trying to stick to the text this time without cutting in so we can actually make it through the reading today, ladies and gentlemen. Now, 17. Acts or operations do follow the soul, yet come not suddenly or promiscuously, but some of them come together with being made man, being about brutish or unreasonable things. But the purer operations do insensibly, in the change of time, work with the oblique part of the soul. And these operations depend upon bodies. And truly, they that are becoming flesh come from the divine bodies into mortal ones. So is this talking about the spiritual existence, like as a light body or a, you know, a wisp, so to speak. And then you come from this light body or spiritual body into the mortal realm and the physical. So make, this reminds me of the beginning of Genesis and how there's two creations and how one of them, it seems like it was perfect and we were like, wisps floating around or like little light bodies or spiritual entities i guess non-physical and then in the second creation all in the very beginning it's like everything was made physical and it was it was like it was destroyed and there was nothing it was it's very interesting we'll have to look at that someday ladies and gentlemen i'm sure though you have heard of that the two creations in the beginning of genesis and that possibly being two different times. Now, acts or operations do follow soul, yet come not suddenly. Okay, we did that. But the pure operations do insensibly, in the change of time, work with the oblique part of the soul. And these operations 
depend upon bodies and truly that they are becoming flesh. Come from the divine bodies into mortal ones. 20. But every one of them acts in both about the body and the soul and are present with the soul even without the body. And there are always operations, but the soul is not always in a mortal body, for it can be without a body. But operations cannot be without bodies. Very fascinating, the distinction there. 22. This is a sacred speech, O son. The body cannot consist without a soul. And that was where we left off last time, with Tot always asking the great question, what do you mean, O oh Father? 24, he replies, Understand it thus, O Tat. When a soul is separated from the body, the body remains. And this same body, according to the time of its abode, is actuated or operated in that it is dissolved and becomes invisible. And these things the body cannot suffer without act or operation. So without act or operation, the normal functioning flow of physical reality would not work. In these things, the bodies cannot suffer without act or operation. And consequently, there remains with the body the same act or operation. This then is the difference between an immortal body and a mortal one. Wow. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, that the immortal one consists of one matter. And so doth not the mortal one. And the immortal one does. But this suffers. So we just had an explanation of the difference between an immortal and a mortal body. Very deep, ladies and gentlemen. I'll read those three lines and continue again. That was powerful. And this same body, according to the time of its abode, is actuated or operated in that it dissolves and becomes invisible. And these things the body cannot suffer without act or operation. And consequently, there remains with the body the same act or operation. This, then, is the difference between an immortal body and a mortal one, that the immortal one consists of one matter, and so doth not the mortal one, and the immortal one does, but this suffers. And everything that acts or operates is stronger and holds sway, but that which is actuated or operated is subjugated. Everything that acts and operates is stronger and holds sway, but that which is actuated or operated so being acted upon or operated you know, upon as compared to that which acts or operates to that which is actuated or operated. See the distinctions there, these words, is subjugated. That which rules also directs and governs as free, but the other is ruled and is a servant. Line number 30 in chapter number 14 in the Corpus Hermeticum, of sense and operation. Acts do not only require, act or operate, sorry, acts do not only act or operate, living or breathing, or in soul within living bodies, but also corpses, or without souls, wood and stones, and such like, increasing and bearing fruit, ripening, corrupting, rotting, putrefying and breaking and working such like things and whatsoever inanimate bodies can suffer. Act or operation, O son, is called whatsoever is or is made or done. And there are always many things made, or rather all things. For the world is never widowed or forsaken of any of those things that are, but being always carried or moved itself, it is in labor to bring forth the things that are, which shall never be left by it to corruption. Let, therefore, every act or operation be understood to be always immortal, in what manner of body soever it be, 
But some acts or operations are divine, some of corruptible bodies, some universal, some peculiar, and some of the generals, and some of the parts of everything. So he's describing the different acts and operations that exist within reality and how they're connected to the functioning of reality. And the souls and you know, the spiritual nature and the physical nature or the soul and the body. But remember, some acts or operations are divine. Some of corruptible bodies, which mean physical mortal, some universal, some peculiar, some of the generals, and some of the parts of everything. 35, divine acts or operations, therefore, there be, and such as work or operate upon their proper bodies. And these also are perfect and being upon or in perfect bodies. Particularly, particular are they which work by any of the living creatures. Proper be they that work upon any of the things that are. By this discourse, therefore, O son, it is gathered that all things are full of operations. So that's the gist of everything that was just given to us. All things are full of operations. For it necessarily, for if necessarily they be in every body, and that there be many bodies in the world, I may very well affirm that there be many other acts or operations. For many items in one body, there is one, and a second, and a third, besides these universal ones that follow. And universal operations, I call them, that are indeed bodily, and are done by the senses and motions. For without these, it is impossible that the body should exist. But other operations are proper to the souls of men, by arts, sciences, studies, and actions. The senses also follow these operations, or rather are the effects of them. Understand, therefore, O son, the difference of operations from acts. See, there's a lot of talk of acts and operations here. Acts, as he said before, do not only act or operate, living or breathing or ensouled within living bodies, but also corpses. So, ah, so he's saying these acts or operations of the functioning of reality not only happen within living things. See, that goes back to when he mentioned the stones earlier, like rocks and stones. But they also, just like plants, break down and decay and create fertilizer and opportunity for new life to come from it. But he's saying even in corpses here, these acts and operations are continuing to function as a process of physical and spiritual reality. For many items in one body, there is one and a second and a third besides these universal ones that follow. For without these, it is impossible that the body should exist. And so, understand therefore, O son, the difference of operations. It is sent from above. The senses also follow these operations, or rather are the effects of them. But since being in a body and having its essence from it, when it receives act or operation, manifests it, making it, as it were, corporeal. Therefore, I say that the senses are both corporeal and mortal, having so much existence as the body, for they are born with the body and die with it. But mortal things themselves have not sense as not consisting of such an essence. For sense can be of no other than a corporeal apprehension, either of good or evil, that comes to the body. Line number 50. 
to external bodies, there is nothing which comes, nothing which departs, therefore there is no sense in them. 51. Tot asked, does the sense therefore perceive or apprehend in every body? In every body, O son. He continued, and do the acts or operations work in all things, even in things inanimate, O son? So there's the big lesson. Do these acts or operations work in all things, even in things inanimate, O son? But there are differences of senses. For the senses of the things rational are with reason of things unreasonable, corporeal only. But the senses of things inanimate are passive only, according to augmentation and diminution. So to me, what that's meaning is the level of consciousness for different, you know, like the rock kingdom and the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, and then up to us. And the different levels of sense and then also we can have rational or unrational sense or reasonable or unreasonable. And I'll read that line again. Even the things inanimate have sense, but there are differences of senses. Acts and operations work in all things. However, for the senses of things rational are with reason of things unreasonable, corporeal, only but the senses of things inanimate so like rocks are passive only according to augmentation or diminution but passion and sense depend both upon one head or spirit and are gathered together into the same by acts or operations but in living spirits there be two other operations that follow the senses and passions to wit, grief, and pleasure. And without these, it is impossible that a living spirit, especially a reasonable one, should perceive or apprehend. So without the operations that follow the senses and passions to wit, grief, and pleasure, it would be impossible that we should perceive or apprehend. And therefore I say that these are the ideas of passions that bear rule, especially in reasonable living spirits. The operations work indeed, but the senses do declare and manifest the operations, and they being bodily are moved by the brutish parts of the soul. Therefore I say, they are both malevolent and doers of evil. 61, and we have six more lines. We're doing good. Stuck to the text today, ladies and gentlemen. I know a lot of you appreciate and like my ramblings, but sometimes I want to try to stick to it and not, because I've realized in the past when I ramble like I am now, but it takes away from what you'd be getting from the next you know, like if I jump in every 10 lines and it's like, oh, what the five lines after that were going to mean to the lines we just read gets kind of jumbled. So that's why I've been trying to stick to it today. And it's a little longer one. And we normally don't make it through the whole thing in one video. So we're going to do it this time. We've only got six left, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you're getting value. If you are. Thank you for being here. And I love and appreciate you. And once again, contemplation. Constant contemplation, meditation, rumination, and pondering upon will lead to actually grasping and getting a truer understanding of, as Hermes Trismegistus puts it, the things that are. A pure philosophy is a spiritual striving through constant contemplation to attain true knowledge of Atum, the one God, as it was put in the first words of the Hermetica, the lost wisdom of the Pharaohs. Now, line number 60 to 67. The operations work indeed, but the senses do declare and manifest the operations. And they, being bodily, are moved by the brutish parts of the soul. 
Therefore I say, they are both malevolent and doers of evil. The brutish parts of the body are the doers of evil. Manifest the operations in being bodily are moved by the brutish parts of the soul. So see that physical nature always being referred to as like the bad, brutish, evil, not, you know, it's like, and then the non-physical, everything that's detached is kind of when you think of how you can detach your ego connection to your status and the thing, you know, things and having to have an attachment to things that then causes this kind of survival pr protecting and a lack of harmony and oneness of thought in harmony with reality and nature very interesting though sorry see i jumped in again 61 for that which affords the sense to rejoice with pleasure is thus the cause of many evils happening to him that suffers it. For that which affords the sense to rejoice with pleasure is thus the cause of many evils happening to him that suffers it. 62. But sorrow gives stronger torments and anguish. Therefore, doubtless, are they both malevolent. The same may be said of the sense of the soul. Tot asked, Is not the soul incorporeal? And the sense a body, Father? Or is it rather in the body? This is a really good question. Ta is asking good questions here. 65. If we put it in a body, O Son, we shall make it like the soul. For the operations for these being intangible, we say, are in bodies. So incorporeal, intangible, non-physical. I use spiritual to describe non-physical. You know, like as compared to physical and non physical. But very interesting then, the distinction. Is not the soul incorporeal, spiritual, non physical, and the sense a body, so physical? Or is it rather in the body, the sense, and not the physical nature, but a, a spiritual nature or an intangible, incorporeal? And he answers If we put it in a body, the sense, O son, we shall make it like the soul, or the operations, for these being intangible, we say are in bodies. So he answers there, this, the sense is intangible if we put it in a body. But sense is neither operation, nor soul, nor anything else that belongs to the body. But as we have said, and therefore, it is not incorporeal. So it can be both. Apparently, in the final line of the 14th chapter of the Corpus Hermeticum of sense and operation, wait, of operation and sense. And if it be not incorporeal, it must needs be a body. For we always say that of things that are, some are bodies and some are incorporeal. Of the things that are, remember all the way back in the very beginning, Hermes Trismegistus, his first book. He says, oh, my son, write this book for both humanity's sake and for piety towards God, for honor, for reverence, appreciation. For there can be no religion, spiritual pursuit, philosophy, more true or just than to know the things that are and to acknowledge thanks for all things and to that which have made them which thing we shall not cease continually to do. And this final line here reminding us of that. And if it be not incorporeal, it must needs be a body, for we always say that of things that are, so seeking to know the things that are, just the nature of reality, that of the things that are, some are physical and some are spiritual or non-physical. In other words, some are bodies and some incorporeal. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, we actually made it through a whole chapter without too much interruptions.
That's amazing. Good job. And I think we'll leave it there for today. Keep it simple. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, seek to achieve and maintain happiness through enlightenment, through a greater awareness and understanding of the nature of the things that are, of reality, so that through this awareness and through this understanding, we can begin to increase the quality of not only our lives, but the lives of those around us. And also remember, ladies and gentlemen, to seek to discover the lost wisdom of the ages and the mysteries of our history as well. Remember that there is no way to happiness because happiness is the way. It is what we must bring to life. And when we can create that ability within ourselves to bring happiness to life, then all the things we've been telling ourselves, oh, when I get there and have this much and then I'll be happy, that becomes irrelevant because we already are there. And hopefully the entire journey is wonderful. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 15, I think there's only three left. Chapter 15 is of truth to his son taught. The first line, we'll give a little teaser here. Of truth, though taught, is it not possible that man, being an imperfect being, compounded of imperfect members and having his tabernacle consisting of different and many bodies, should speak with any confidence? But as far as it is possible, I just say that truth is only in eternal bodies, whose very bodies are also true. Very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. This should be a good one next week. And it's a 50-liner, so kind of a medium length. Some of them were like 120. Boom, ladies and gentlemen, that is a boom to Hermetics and our continued study and research in Hermetics and Hermes Trismegistus, the Egyptian sage god Thoth, Tahat, Tat, Tatme. Wonderful. Wonderful, ladies and gentlemen. A shout out to Asclepius. <laughs> A shout out to Asclepius. Oh yeah, be sure to expand the description to get this book for yourself so you can put it on your shelf so you can follow along in the future. And also a link to C60 Power. I think it's C60 Purple Power. I'll just keep calling it Purple Power. C60 Purple Power dot com. Uh, Nobel Prize award winning antioxidant, the most powerful antioxidant known to man, discovered by Buckminster Fuller called the Buckminster Fullerene. You should check it out if you haven't heard of it. I just ordered myself some more yesterday. Proud about that because I've been slacking for like six months and I need to get some C60, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm looking forward to that arriving as well. I have a link to my Etsy shop. So if you'd like to get yourself a landscape painting, I've noticed how the shadow, you can actually see the color there in the background. It's funny, but all right. Love and appreciate all of you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here, and I will catch you on the flip side. <laughs> catch you next time. Remember, be the change that you want to see. Be the example you want to set. No, 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 no.